Hello everyone, this is Anton, and you know what, for many months now, many of you have been asking me to try to terraform an asteroid, or possibly talk about the possibility of, of doing so in the future. Or if we actually can terraform an asteroid. Well, today you're going to find out if it's possible, and we're going to try to do this using Universe Sandbox 2. Welcome to What The Math, and if you still haven't subscribed to this channel, click that subscribe button right now. <laughs> And so first and foremost, we're actually not going to be terraforming this particular asteroid known as Kunask, which is actually a randomly generated asteroid that I just placed in the solar system. We're going to terraform the largest asteroid known to us, which of course is right there. It is our beautiful Vesta, also known as 4 Vesta, because this is the fourth asteroid to have ever been discovered by the humans. But before we start, uh, this is actually not what it looks like at all. This is actually what this game generates it as. The real shape of Vesta, we actually know it very, very well now because there was a mission called Dawn Mission that visited Vesta a few years ago and mapped it very, very, very precisely. And uh, this is what Vesta looks like in Space Engine. This is actually very realistic, very, very beautiful asteroid. Unfortunately, um, Universe Sandbox is unable to do it this way. It's kind of, it's a very difficult, very complex recreation or it actually would require a very complex recreation and some kind of an algorithm that this game just doesn't have. Uh, so instead we get these types of um, asteroids. Now, let me just show you why this actually happens that way. So in this particular game, uh, there are several types of uh, objects. It obviously starts with an asteroid, and this is just a randomly generated one. This one is called a uh, Tutu. And uh, depending on the mass of the object, if it's under a certain amount, it's going to look asteroid. It's going to have these little bumps and uh, is going to be basically a rock. But the thing is, it doesn't uh, have any atmosphere and it's unable to have atmosphere because the game doesn't really allow it to have atmosphere. If I start increasing its mass at some point, it's going to experience what's known as hydrostatic equilibrium. Now, Vesta actually doesn't have that. And what hydrostatic equilibrium refers to is You'll see it in a second, right around, right around now, there we go. As soon as it becomes a spherical object. This is what Vesta looks like in this game, but it really shouldn't because it didn't achieve a hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, Ceres has, however. If I actually look at Ceres, if I show you Ceres, see how Ceres is a sphere? It has achieved a um, hydrostatic equilibrium, whereas Vesta or any of these other asteroids, including Chiriklo, which I've talked about in one of the previous videos, uh, they don't have that. They're not They're not supposed to be spherical, but unfortunately, this would require some crazy um, reprogramming of this game. So for this reason, we have these spherical asteroids here. And um, this particular spherical asteroid doesn't really have atmosphere either, so it's impossible to terraform it until it reaches a mass of about 3 times 10 to the power of 20, and you can see this number right here, um, kilograms. So as soon as it crosses that, and it's going to happen in a second, as soon as it crosses that number, it becomes right about now, there we go. It becomes a minor planet or basically a dwarf planet. Uh, Ceres in this game has that, it has the surface, but uh, unfortunately Vesta does not. But as soon as it acquires the surface, this is when you can now play around with atmosphere. So basically what we have to do first is we have to turn Vesta into this. And how can we actually do that? Well, obviously it needs to acquire more mass. We're going to uh, collide with another asteroid from the asteroid belt. Uh, in terms of mass, actually, um, Vesta is about one third of mass of Ceres, and for comparison, this is what series looks like it's actually larger and it's more massive as well um, but it's still uh, it's actually a, a relatively large object for the asteroid belt it's about nine percent of the entire mass of the asteroid belt so it's a pretty pretty big object and in terms of the size here it's 265 um, uh, kilometers in diameter so across right here and uh, because it's kind of prolonged shape in reality uh, it does have slightly smaller side here uh, and anyway, so let's collide with something. Let's actually maybe take um, uh, this other asteroid that's slightly smaller than, um, than Vesta. This is actually Pallas, and it's supposed to be smaller because it's less massive. And we basically are just going to launch it um, and create a collision between them. So this is maybe something that we'll be, we'll be able to do in the future when we're 
more knowledgeable about you know planetary sciences and, and all that stuff so here we go there's a collision we, I think it changed their orbit just a little bit but if we do collide them together chances are they might actually change orbits as well uh, so now Vesta is going to become way more massive obviously is going to get you know molten for a few possibly thousands of years and you can already see it grow larger now because it's completely molten now this is when it's going to start acquiring this hydrostatic equilibrium because now it actually has just enough mass for this i think yeah it's just over 3 um 3.39 um so i'm going to manually cool it down just so we can get this going faster and there is the surface of our our new uh, it's actually called palace it shouldn't be a palace it should be vesta and for some unknown reason, Palace is actually larger and more massive um, in this particular game. Possibly a mistake, possibly something they forgot to change in one of the uh, recent updates. But anyway, so here we go. So here's our Vesta. It is now technically a dwarf planet. Um, and we can now play around with its atmosphere. And uh, ooh, here we go. It should appear now. Um, and now give it a bit of atmosphere and start changing its composition. But essentially, because it had a collision, a lot of new materials have been added to it. Originally, it, it only had um, an iron core, which you can kind of see right here. This is actually, used to be a lot larger. It used to be about this big. It was about uh, 270 kilometers in diameter, and the rest was a rock. So if you actually look at the structure of Vesta currently, this is what it looks like. So there is um, there's an iron core. It's uh, actually not just iron. It's iron and nickel, uh, which is another metal. Uh, iron and nickel co core. And then you have this rocky layer. And on top of all of this, there is something called regolith, which is something that our moon has as well. So it's kind of a rocky composition. There actually might be some water. There might be some ices, but not very much and not enough to make a difference. Um, but all of these icy thingies, icy layers, can be brought from other asteroids. And so we're going to add a little bit of water until we get some surface ice appearing right about now. And here we go. We have a little bit of uh, surface ice here. Uh, it's about... 0.005% uh, of total mass and basically it's all solid because currently we're really far away from from the sun and we're not really getting that much heat from anything really uh, because it's a relatively small object and it's it's farther away from the sun than Mars. Uh, now so what are the problems with our terraforming plan? How can we actually now terraform this? Well first of all we obviously need atmosphere but to maintain this atmosphere to actually you know, keep it on the surface of Vesta, this uh, object needs to have magnetic field, and currently it has nothing. To create magnetic field, um, we would need to somehow make the um, inner inner layers of this um, object to start moving around, to basically start uh, creating the magnetic field the same way it's made on Earth. But um, honestly, we there's absolutely no way we can do this. We, don't, we have no technology, we have no knowledge of how it's done. But you know what, maybe in the future we'll be able to kind of create this differently by having some sort of a, you know, layer of cables on the surface of an object that will create uh, a kind of a fake artificial magnetic field using nothing but electricity, because this is something we know more about than how magnetic field is created in reality. And so let's just say that we now have a magnetic field going around this object so that it's actually going to be protected from, um, from the solar radiation and also from all kinds of um, highly energetic but highly dangerous particles that may actually strip this object of its atmosphere and also obviously kill any kind of life on it. Uh, so now we can start adding atmosphere, and this can come from other asteroids, it can also come from evaporation of water, and uh, we might also bring some carbon dioxide from um, some of the objects in the vicinity of asteroid belt, and so let's just say we've created an atmospheric pressure of about one atmosphere, making uh, Vesta look like this. It's a very beautiful looking object now that has something that actually kind of looks like atmosphere. And now on the bottom here, it actually says that the greenhouse effect is 22 degrees. But the thing is, if I actually start changing this, um, I don't know if this is a bug that has been recently reintroduced into the game because it used to happen before, uh, but uh, it doesn't really affect greenhouse effect anymore. It doesn't really do anything, at least for smaller objects and for um, some places like Mars and Earth. So it doesn't really matter if we change the surface pressure because it will not affect greenhouse effect. Um, but this slider does a little bit, infrared emissivity, and so does this one, albedo. 
Now, albedo here would be about 25 to 30%, so we're going to leave it at 27. Albedo refers to the how, um, basically, reflectivity, uh, or how reflective this object is compared to other objects. So, a very dark object would be zero, a very bright object would be um, one, and, uh, like, for example, Venus is 90. Um, there are some really dark objects out there that have something like two. Earth is about 30 to 35. This would be about 27 because it's a little bit darker than Earth. And so with these parameters, our current temperature is going to be about minus 40 degrees Celsius. That's still pretty cold. That means that ice will still stay as ice and everything is going to be frozen. Now, there is another way we can warm up this object that's obviously colliding more things with it. That's not going to work for us because we actually want to live here. Um, the other thing we could do is obviously reintroduce this as a, possibly as a moon or as a satellite of another more massive object like Jupiter. And then using what's known as tidal heating, which is right here, uh, we can actually warm this object up from the inside. So uh, the same effects that create tides on Earth can be used to warm up this, uh, this planet. But making this a satellite of Jupiter would be a pretty, pretty difficult task. Instead, how about using the previous collision with, um, with the previous asteroid? I think it was Pallas. Uh, we're going to basically use that and change the actual orbit of this object, making it orbit a little bit closer to the sun. So currently, its semi-major axis has been changed to 4.3 uh, from the previous value of about 3, I think. But if I were to collide the asteroid with Pallas um, in the opposite direction of its movement, basically uh, by slowing it down, it would actually change to be a little bit closer. So let's just say it's going to be uh, just past Earth at 1.1 astronomical units. Uh, so let's see what would happen if we actually brought this object a little bit closer to the sun and what the temperature would be now. So, all right, so it says effective temperature 62, and I actually see some evaporation going on here. We are actually, I think, boi boiling something away. I'm guessing it's water. It's probably water that we're losing. So that means that we're a little bit too close to the sun. All right, and the mistake I made was that I actually had a very high eccentricity here. That's why um, I was a little bit closer to the sun than I should have been. Uh, but we're now going to change this a little bit more. Let's make this about 0.8 astronomical units, which is slightly... Um, between Earth and Venus, uh, I guess closer to Venus than it, than it is to Earth. So so now we have this object um, in sort of in the region between Venus and Earth. It's not going to be affected by either planet, but the effective temperature has now ch been changed to minus 15 degrees, meaning that this is actually going to become a very comfortable object to live on, with of course one exception. The exception being that, well, first of all, to maintain this atmospheric pressure, we needed to have a lot more gravi gravity. Um, the gravitational effect here is very, very, very low. Surface gravity here is 2%, 2.4% that of Earth. Basically, you can jump something like 25 times higher than you can on Earth. And this is the same reason why most of this atmosphere eventually will just escape. Um, unless we create some kind of artificial atmosphere that is much heavier than what we have on Earth, uh, which is something maybe we can can do sometime in the future when we know chemistry a little bit better than we do now. But for now, this would be quite impossible. But let's just say that we're able to maintain this atmosphere. So now we have this object that has a good, uh, relatively good temperature. It's going to actually warm up really quickly. And as soon as it warms up, look what happens. It actually acquires liquid oceans. It has clouds in the sky. It's also going to be uh, or become a lot more Earth-like. And if we look at its Earth-like value, uh, it is now something like 38% Earth-like. Earth similarity is 38%. And the likelihood of life here is 5%, meaning that there's a 5% chance that this planet might actually at some point develop life. Or not really planet, this is technically still a dwarf planet. Although we have placed it in a different orbit, so maybe it is a planet. Um, and uh, on top of all of this, obviously... If we actually go here, we'll be very comfortable. We can definitely survive here because there's both water, comfortable temperature, atmosphere, and it's protected from solar radiation. But to do all of this, we actually have to know a lot more about space sciences than we currently do. So things like um, artificial atmosphere that uh, can be maintained on a low gravity object, things like artificial uh, magnetosphere. So how do you create a magnetosphere on an object? And of course, being able to actually change the orbital parameters of an object as well. All of these are quite impossible currently, but maybe in the future we'll be able to do this as well. 
And before that we finish this video, um, you may also want to know some particular details about actual Vesta, the, the real Vesta that you see right here in Space Engine. And so, uh, first of all, this object was actually discovered a long, long time ago, over 200 years ago, back in 1807 by a German scientist. And they found uh, quite a lot of these asteroids and originally up to about 1850, so for over 40 years, they were considered to be planets. So there was Vesta, there were Ceres, there was Juno, and there was uh, Pallas. All of them were considered to be planets, um, and so there were actually 11 planets because we haven't really found Pluto yet. And uh, the name Vesta comes from the uh, Roman goddess for, um, for basically home. And what's really interesting about Vesta is that um, it actually used to be larger. It used to be a little bit larger than, the, than what it currently is. And about 2 billion years ago, it received a collision that uh, sort of fragmented it, making it a little bit smaller. And we can see these two collisions that it received on its surface because it has two very, very large craters. Uh, one is about 500 kilometers in diameter and one is about um, 400 kilometers in diameter. And when these two craters were created, um, the uh, fragments from Vesta ended up uh, basically traveling around the solar system and many of them landed on our planet Earth. So something like one out of 16 um, asteroids that land on our planet are actually from Vesta. And so because of this, we know quite a lot about what's inside Vesta because we've studied these rocks uh, quite thoroughly by now. And the um, actual surface temperature here is a lot colder than what I've currently created here. Uh, it gets to about minus 190 degrees Celsius at night, and it gets to about minus 20 degrees Celsius uh, when it's, you know, right in front of sun, essentially. But despite all of this, surprisingly, we have found traces of liquid water, or liquid something at least. In the last uh, two or three years, scientists have discovered these really strange streaks that can only be created by some kind of a liquid. Now, currently we think it's water and we don't really know how it ended up there, uh, but it could have been really many other liquid objects. So whatever was flowing here may still be there underneath the rock. And lastly, I guess this is another really cool fact about it, is that um, this object is massive enough to actually kind of influence other asteroids, and so um, every time it orbits around the sun, it can actually kind of temporarily capture some of the other asteroids and uh, create sort of moons of Vesta. There's uh, almost 40 we've found so far that are kind of like quasi-satellites that are going to stay with Vesta for a few million years and then are going to be uh, kicked out of the system and uh, become their own objects. But for now, there's a lot, around 40 of them, not too large, not too small, anywhere between a few meters in size to a size of a small house. And uh, all of them are basically kind of like the moons of Vesta. And this was actually very interesting to find because we weren't really sure if asteroids can have moons. But this one is big enough that it actually can. And, uh, well, that's really it. So this is what uh, Vesta has become after years and years of terraforming. It's still kind of acquiring a bit of temperature, but it, it looks like a pretty comfortable object to live on, uh, except, of course, for gravity. So if you want to jump really high and if you want to be able to live on an object that is technically an asteroid and not a planet, this would be the right object for you sometime in the future when we have the technology to do all of this. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. That's all I wanted to do in this video. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to share this and uh, also subscribe if you still haven't. Like this video if you enjoyed watching it. And let me know in the comments below if you have any other ideas about how to possibly terraform an asteroid in this particular game. And if you do have a cool idea, maybe we'll do this in one of the future videos. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.